Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk on CT of the trachea. This is part two. Now, I showed you this slide as I finished up part one and said, look at the trachea. Look at the left main stem bronchus. The left main stem bronchus is diffusely thickened, and it's narrowed, and then there's collapse in the left upper lobe. Here's another look at it. So now you have an infiltrating process. Remember I showed you that uh, polychondritis case. It was left and right main stem bronchus. Here it's just the left main stem, but it's also thickened and irregular, and then it's narrowing the left upper lobe bronchus and causing collapse. What causes infiltration and collapse, as well as showing you an area of ulceration? It's a more aggressive process. You could think about an infiltrating malignancy, and I guess that's a possibility, but you can think of inflammatory and infectious etiologies. Here it's very nicely shown on the coronal, as well as on the um, volume rendered view with virtual bronchoscopy. Again, the ulceration, the irregular narrowing, the infiltration. Again, I would think about malignancy. That's a very real thing to think about. You could also think about trauma. Though you, and, and trauma can cause irregular thickening. It can cause little ulcerations if there was a tear there, perhaps. But also infectious inflammatory. So what do I think about in that scenario? That's when I'm thinking about something like Wegner's granulomatosis. Wegner's can present many different ways in the lung, from nodules, small to single to multiple, to infiltration of the trachea or main stem bronchi, and collapse. Wegner's is interesting. Necrotizing vasculitis that involves small to medium vessels, can involve the air, nose, throat, lung, or kidneys. Clinical presentations range from sinusitis to cough to fever to wheezing and to hematuria. The upper airways are involved in up to 92% of cases, the kidneys in 80% and joints in about 67%. The age of diagnosis usually is 40 to 55 years. Females have airway problems more commonly, but the numbers of patients with Wegner's is equal in the male and female population. And treatment is typically with steroids and cyclophosphamid. In terms of presentations, I mentioned this a moment ago, Cavitary nodules can look like metastatic disease, large airway stenosis, as in this case. The nodules can vary from a centimeter to 10 centimeters. You can have consolidation with or without hemorrhage, subglottic stenosis. However, adenopathy is uncommon, which would make you think of something like Wegner's rather than thinking of a malignancy. When you talk about diffuse narrowing of the trachea or main stem bronchi, I showed you relapsing polychondritis before. Amyloid, sarcoid, Wegener's, carcinoma, infection, and tracheopathia osteochondroplastica are other possibilities. Now, that tracheopathia osteochondroplastica, that's a mouthful. So maybe we'll call it TPO. It's an uncommon, benign, but slowly progressive disease of unknown etiology. It's characterized by endoluminal projection of cartilaginous and bony nodules arising in the submucosa of the trachea. Involvement can extend to the lobar or segmental bronchi. It should be considered in cases where cough, dyspnea, persistent infection, hoarseness, or current hemoptysis remain after appropriate treatment of other diagnoses. Here's a good example. I think what makes it specific in this case is the thickening of the anterior trachea wall, but the calcifications. And you can see that with literally almost nothing else. So look at the sagittal view. Look how nicely you see those little nodules. It almost looks like little polyps, but they're calcified. That's classic for TPO. Beautiful example on these sagittal views as well. Again, sagittal view is very important when looking at the airway, but especially with this diagnosis. And because of those multiple irregularities, this is how the virtual bronchoscopic image would be and this really explains the lesion very nicely. Now, we spoke about diffuse narrowing of the trachea and bronchi, and we went through some of these, and I've shown you a few examples, relapsing polychondritis and Wegner's, are two of the things I showed you. We also talk about non-neoplastic lesions of the trachea, post-intubation stenosis or post-infectious stenosis or post-trauma 
can all cause problems. Systemic diseases that involve the airway, Crohn's, sarcoid, and besets, that's pretty uncommon. Post-intubation is something we do see with stenosis, both in younger patients and children, as well as in adults. We spoke about some of the non-neoplastic lesions in the trachea, diffuse disease. So again, I'm trying to get you to think about things. Is it focal or is it diffuse? When you have post-intubation stenosis, it's very focal. Wegner's is more extensive. Now, I mentioned also you can have severe narrowing of the trachea, as in this case, but this is due to substernal extension of the thyroid. Sometimes patients become extremely short of breath. Look how narrow the thyroid is. You can see it's for a fairly long zone in this patient with a large substernal thyroid, so that can become an important possibility. Narrowing of the trachea, as we mentioned, can be intrinsic or extrinsic, as it is in this case, and again, look at the extent of the substernal extension of the thyroid. This patient will need to have uh, the thyroid resected, but you need to be careful that the airway doesn't collapse. And here it is very nicely shown on the sagittal view as well. Again, it's often a classic diagnosis on the patient's topogram. Here, unlike the last case, which was for the most part surrounding the trachea, here it's more compressing from right to left. Uh, not quite as bad as the prior case, but the patients can be symptomatic and it can be confused with other causes of mediastinal masses, particularly on a chest x-ray. So just a very nice example of substernal extension of the thyroid going mainly on the right side, causing narrowing of the trachea. Now, here's that same patient. You can see the airway being narrowed by the compression extrinsic in. Now, I have to admit if you only looked at these images, you can say, well, how do I know it's not a primary tracheal process? Obviously, you're looking at all of the images. Now, there's some unusual conditions. Here's a patient with narrowing of the trachea. It looks like a soft tissue mass here. Looks almost like the case of adenoid cystic tumor I showed you. But now we see more infiltration posteriorly and to the left by the AP window. As we scan further downward in this 28-year-old with weight loss, you see something infiltrating and extending down to the level of the tracheal bifurcation. And in fact, extending lower, it looks almost like adenopathy, but it's really something extending down and infiltrating. And you can see how the airways are narrowed, the trachea as well as the more distal airways. You can see some hyperinflation in the lung fields with areas of air trapping. Again, a few more images. So what are we dealing with? This is an unusual condition, rhinoscleroma. Now, what you saw in tracheal biopsy, squamous mucosa with dense plasma cells, lymphocytic and histiocytic infiltrate, a lot of positive findings consistent with rhinoscleroma on the pathology. It's an unusual diagnosis, but something you can consider Think about something causing narrowing, but also giving you soft tissue mass. It's a tough diagnosis, often not suggested by the radiologist, but it's a chronic process involving the upper airways. It's endemic in the sub subtropical and tropical areas, with 80% reported in five endemic foci, Mexico, South and Central America, Africa, Indonesia, and Eastern Europe. Infection via person-to-person -person transmission, usually in lower socioeconomic groups. Um, in the US, there's only a handful of cases, so you may not be making the diagnosis before the pathologist. One thing about it, compared to other things I've showed you, it's younger patients, also upper airway involvement. There's four different stages. So if you have a patient who has this abnormality in the trachea, mainstem bronchi, it's extensive, it's a younger patient. It's not the typical age for malignancy. Rhinoscleroma at least is something to think about, but of course they will be getting a biopsy. So again, tracheal stenosis, we think about is it the trachea or is it the main stem bronchi or is it both? Is it short segment involvement or is it longer involvement? Now I mentioned stenosis is often short segment involvement. Here's a patient with stenosis from intubation. You can see the area of narrowing 
and what looks like almost like a little ulceration here. This is the zone of trauma. You then get granulation tissue. You can see the irregularity here. This often will be treated by laser therapy if this it becomes narrowed and the patient becomes symptomatic. But you can see, uh, if you look at patients who've been intubated, and particularly patients with tracheostomies, you can see areas of narrowing. It's really granulation tissue. So it's something to think about, particularly with the right clinical history, particularly if the patients are symptomatic. And patients with prolonged intubation are more likely to get complications of tracheal stenosis. Again, very nicely shown here on these um, images with virtual bronchoscopy. Now, unusual conditions. Here's a patient with shortness of breath. There are patchy infiltrates which look like hemorrhage, but there's something in the right main stem bronchus going down to the bronchus intermedius. You can see it right here. There's something literally filling in. Now, you can say it's mucus, it's low density, but the patient has hemorrhage. And we'll look at a few other images. There it is sitting there again. Well, when you go through a differential diagnosis, surely the first thing I would think about would be blood clot. There's no doubt about it. But also it extends to the upper lung areas, but maybe it's a lot of blood and you can see that in the airway. But when you do the virtual bronchoscopic views, look how it fills in the airway. Again, I am thinking hemorrhage and blood clot. You could think about mucus. But there is an entity which gives you what looks like a cast within the patient's major airways, and that's plastic bronchitis. It's a very unusual entity, and I'll let you have five seconds to look at this so you kind of freeze it in your memory. It denotes the formation and expectoration of branching mucoid bronchial casts that can be astonishing large. I love that word, astonishing. The branching pattern may match the bronchial distribution of an entire lobe or lung, although the condition is usually a sign of an underlying bronchopulmonary disorder such as asthma or allergy. The cause of cast formation remain, remains an enigma in some cases. So a very uh, unusual diagnosis, clinical presentation, cough, dyspnea, chest pain, fever, and wheezing. Radiologic evaluation reveals the site of the bronchial cast impaction demonstrating atelectasis or infiltrate. Hyperinflation is also evident on the contralateral side. CT is terrific in these cases by allowing visualization of the cast within the major airway. So I've gone through a number of different things and really what you can see is large airway disease is a heterogeneous group of diseases from focal to diffuse from benign to malignant, from inflammatory. I didn't show you some examples. For example, I didn't show you tuberculosis. I didn't show you sarcoidosis. There are many more things I can show you. I didn't show you an impacted foreign body. But you can see there's a large differential diagnosis. And again, think about it in a logical fashion. Where the location is, is it focal or diffuse? trachea or bronchi, how extensive the process is, how narrowing the stenosis is. And I think when you take all of those things into consideration, you're going to do a great job in your differential diagnosis. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CT is Us YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctsus.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.